Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Kahn Marshall, and I am a Senior Program Analyst at the National Association of County and City Health Officials. And I currently work on our Chronic Disease and Tobacco Prevention and Control Initiative. And good afternoon. My name is Diana Kotsmasek, and I am the Senior Analyst at the, at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, and I also focus my work on tobacco and chronic disease prevention. We would like to welcome you to today's interactive webinar, E-Cigarettes, A Path to a Policy, Perspectives from Local and State Health Departments. This webinar is the first of a series of webinars that ASSO and NACHO will be offering this year on emerging topics related to tobacco control. Since the 1964 Surgeon General's report formally established the severe health risks of smoking, the U.S. has made considerable progress on tobacco control. The emergence of novel tobacco products such as electronic cigarettes, however, presents new challenges to both state and local public health agencies. As of this morning, we have 460 registered participants for this webinar, further emphasizing the interest in this topic. During this webinar, presenters will describe policy efforts on a local and state level addressing e-cigarettes. Specifically, the presenters will provide an overview of electronic cigarette products and identify what an e-cigarette is, describe the current status of the FDA in regards to e-cigarette regulation and its implications for local and state health agencies. The webinar We'll review examples of policies specifically addressing e-cigarettes and describe resources that are available to help state and local efforts. We are delighted to have experts presenting on efforts in the state of Minnesota, Seattle King County, and Chicago. Following our introductions, all of the speakers will present about the various strategies at the state and local level to address e-cigarettes. All phone lines for participants have been muted during this webinar. If you have a question for one of our speakers, please post it to the chat box on your screen at any time during the webinar. These questions will be used during the Q&A after today's presentations. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be directed to an evaluation survey. Please take a few minutes to inform us about the work you are doing around the topic of e-cigarettes and provide us with feedback on today's webinar. We look forward to hearing your comments. Also, a recording of this webinar will be posted to the ASCO and NATO website in the next few days. These sites are available on the last slide. We are joined today by an esteemed panel of experts who will be telling you individually more about their specific role in tobacco control. Due to the overwhelming interest in the topic, we have decided to provide a brief overview of the agenda prior to our panel presentation. We will announce each of the speakers now, and then the webinar will continue to each speaker without further introduction. We anticipate that there will be many questions for our speakers, so we have allotted time for that at the conclusion of the panel presentation. We are joined today by Mark Meany, a staff attorney at the Public Health Law Center, who will provide the introduction and overview to the topic. Mark will also provide conclusions and recommendations for resources after each of the examples have been provided. There are three examples in today's webinar. Chris Focus will be sharing the story of Minnesota strategies. Chris is the supervisor for alcohol and tobacco prevention and control at the Minnesota Department of Health. Then we will be joined by Scott Neal, who will be presenting strategies from Seattle and King County. Scott is the Tobacco Prevention Program Manager for Public Health Seattle King County. Our final example will be from Chicago and will be presented by Kendall Stagg, the Director of Policy with the Bureau of Policy Planning and Legislative Affairs at the Chicago Department of Public Health. If you have a question for one of our speakers, please post it to the chat box on your screen at any time during the webinar. We will now begin the presentation portion of the webinar 
and I'm now going to turn it over to Mark. Thanks a lot, Diana and Jennifer, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this uh, beautiful, cold afternoon here in Minnesota, at least. Um, it sounds like it's snowy in Washington, D.C. Um, as Jennifer said, my name is Mark Meany, and I'm a staff attorney with the Tobacco Control Legal Consortium. I'm going to start things off today by giving you a broad overview of e-cigarettes before other speakers talk about some specific legislative initiatives in their own jurisdictions. I'm going to talk briefly about what we mean when we talk about e-cigarettes, why these are such an important issue right now, and then I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the very, unfortunately, very, very short history of federal, regula federal regulation um, and how we got to where we are today. Um, I, I work at the uh, Tobacco Control Legal Consortium, and we're a network of legal centers, and we provide free legal technical assistance, research, and education on issues related to tobacco and health throughout the country. Our activities are coordinated through our offices here um, at the Public Health Law Center in St. Paul, Minnesota, and we work with affiliated legal centers throughout the country. All right, so let's start at the, at the very beginning. I think when I, when I talked about e-cigarettes over the past year, um, both on a personal level and I think with, with, with the audience, it was, it was um, often on a theoretical level. Um, but over the past year, I think it's become a lot more concrete as we've seen e-cigarettes uh, being used in a variety of places, in supermarkets and in, in shopping malls. Um, so I think we've all, you know, we're all seeing them all over the place now. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's become more, um, I think, in our, in our own neighborhood. Um, the FDA defines them as battery-operated products that are designed to deliver nicotine flavor and other chemicals. Um, that's not certainly a definition that I think we would probably recommend using for, um, for your local and state laws, but it's, um, it's how the FDA is defining them. Um, and as the, as the, the um, products have been proliferating, they're, they're, they don't necessarily fit into one specific category. Um, the other thing we've seen recently is that there are a lot more that are advertised and not containing nicotine um, as well, and so we want to make sure when we're drafting legislation that we include um, all the products that we intend to include. Okay, so again, what, what are these products? Um, for quite a while, we thought of e-cigarettes kind of as the product that's in the lower left corner of the screen. That's the one that looks essentially like a conventional cigarette. Um, however, as the market has exploded, no, um, probably poor choice of words, but um, the market has exploded, you can see that many of the products no longer resemble conventional cigarettes. They're just as likely to look like a pen or a flash drive or some sort of a musical instrument as they are a, 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 a conventional cigarette. Um, over the past weekend, I actually saw a television commercial that was um, for an e-cigarette brand, um, and they were emphasizing the fact that using it doesn't even necessarily look like you're using a cigarette anymore, and that was the primary um, rationale for the commercial. And I think that was kind of interesting because it, it um, is one way to kind of circumvent, I think, one of the key rationales for including um, e-cigarettes in smoke-free laws, and that's being uh, that they help to renormalize the act of smoking. We hear a lot about the dramatic market growth in e-cigarettes, um, and estimates certainly vary substantially from, um, from group to group, but it's pretty clear that the, the business is, is, um, is booming. Last year, I gave a presentation over the summer, and at that point, there was um, speculation that the e-cigarette market was probably going to approach $1 billion for um, 2013. Um, six months later, now we're looking at it, and um, Projections have, have shown that it, it's probably been closer to about $1.7 billion in 2013. So uh, that coming from $500 million in 2012 for a product that was introduced, I think, initially uh, just about 11 years ago, it's, it's really a dramatic growth. Um, how large the market could get uh, is certainly is anybody's guess, but um, for those who are paid to make those guesses, um, I think the, 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 the market feeling is that, that we're just really scratching the surface. Um, and as it says here, there are some analysts who think they can overtake um, conventional cigarettes within the next 10 years, which should be, um, you know, remarkable, obviously. So why is this important now? One of the key factors, uh, what was recently a fringe market has gone mainstream, and each of the three largest tobacco companies has either over the past year or two um, developed an e-cigarette product themselves or they've purchased an existing product. So we know that the market is not going to be going away, that it's, it's, it's here for the long term. 
So why are we concerned about these things? We keep hearing they help people quit smoking, right? Well, we're concerned for a number of reasons. First um, of all, to this point, studies haven't shown that e-cigarettes are an especially effective means to quit smoking. While we certainly hear a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that they are, we're hoping that further research will help to clarify this one way or another. Until that point, though, um, the concern is still there. Second, and, and, and I think very important, is that it seems likely that uh, e-cigarettes are probably an easy entry point for new customers to become addicted to nicotine. With the proliferation of kid-friendly flavors like cotton candy and bubble gum and gummy bear flavor, whatever that is, um, it doesn't seem like it's that much of a stretch to think that these might be appealing to children. Also, recent CDC studies have backed this point up. In fact, the CDC published um, some research in the fall of last year which showed that between 2011 and 2012 that um, the number of kids who were using e-cigarettes has doubled. And many of these kids have, weren't, weren't, kids, weren't um, kids who ever actually even tried to, um, conventional cigarettes either, so it's not, uh, it's not necessarily means to, for kids to quit. Another significant concern is that we simply don't know what's in the products. There are hundreds of e-cigarette companies producing products that are made that lack any discernible manufacturing standards and they come with spotty quality control. Um, when they've been evaluated, scientists have found varying levels of nicotine along with a variety of carcinogenic chemicals. Um, also, since many of the products are being uh, mixed on site at, at individual vape shops, um, it's much more difficult, if not impossible, to determine exactly what people are inhaling when they use these products. So are they healthy or healthier, and are they healthy for the user? Are they healthier for those who are around than, than conventional cigarettes? Um, again, there's just not a lot of scientific data about the long-term effects of vaping. Um, I think most people think it's probably healthier than smoking cigarettes, but nobody really knows how healthy it is. Um, also, since there's a general perception that there are no risks associated with secondhand vapor, but there are some studies that are starting to produce data that could bring this uh, point into question. Uh, for example, there was a recent study in the International Journal of Hygiene and Health that showed that there was an increase in carcinogenic hydrocarbons as a result of vaping um, indoors. This study was also consistent with some other studies that show higher levels of, higher levels of nicotine um, in each of the products than are claimed by the manufacturers. So again, we just don't know what's in the products. Marketing. Um, it's, I think it's come as, as a surprise to a lot of people that when they, you know, you're kind of used to not seeing tobacco products being um, advertised in, um, on television or on billboards to see e-cigarettes, uh, but since they are not being regulated currently, they aren't subject to the same restrictions as tobacco products. Um, so you're probably seeing ads on television and newspapers, um, using electronic media, places like Groupon that have um, frequently have um, deals for um, electronic cigarette type products. Um, and look at uh, this is one of my favorites. But you know the question is who are they targeting with these with these ads? Um, who does Santa Claus um, want to begin vaping? Last summer, the World Health Organization issued a statement on e-cigarettes, and in it they strongly advised people not to use them. And they, they based this, uh, this uh, statement on the fact that when they were doing testing, they found widely variable amounts of nicotine and other substances um, in these cigarettes that they were testing. And they coupled that with the fact that there isn't um, any, any good scientific data to show that they actually do help people quit smoking. So now we get to the point of regulation. So who is regulating these products? In many cases, that, the answer is nobody. Nobody's regulating them. Um, they're also being regulated often in ways that might not be fully comprehensive. And today, as uh, Jennifer and Diana said, we're going to hear from some experts from three different jurisdictions that have taken some action um, to regulate e-cigarettes and discuss both how and why they took those steps. But first, I want to look briefly at some of the legal and the regulatory landscape that um, allowed us to arrive at the point where we are today. So again, back to our, our, our first question, what are these products? Are they drug delivery devices or are they tobacco products? Um, you know, from your perspective, you might say, who cares? It doesn't matter. They should be regulated regardless. Um, but from a regulatory perspective, this becomes a really important question. Um, 
And the part of that is, is a question of how they're being marketed. And by that I mean, um, are they being marketed as products that are going to help existing smokers quit? In that case, they would be regulated as drug delivery devices. Um, and if, if you listen to most of the ads, um, there's a, a, a very clear intention not to market them um, as such. On the other hand, if they're, mar if they're um, are these a product that um, is just a healthier alternative to smoking? And if so, then, they, then they're likely more likely to be um, regulated on the federal level as tobacco products. In 2009, uh, the FDA decided that it was, it was going to try to regulate them as drug delivery devices. They decided they weren't going to allow a shipment of Enjoy e-cigarettes into the United States, claiming that they were unregulated drug delivery devices. And so they were regulating them under what's called the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. Um, at that point, a, a different company called Smoking Everywhere sued, and they were ultimately joined by Enjoy. And they argued that the FDA did not have the authority to regulate them under this particular law. Um, a district court and then ultimately a, a federal appeals court um, upheld the, uh, found for the, the, the plaintiffs and said that since the products weren't being marketed to have therapeutic purposes, or in other words, they weren't being marketed as tobacco cessation devices, the FDA could only regulate them as tobacco products under the Tobacco Control Act. So it gave some, uh, some clear direction that they could be, could be regulated as such, um, and now we're waiting. So this is a uh, screenshot from the FDA website from last week. And as you can see, maybe, if you uh, have very good eyes, uh, the FDA has clearly stated that it intends to regulate e-cigarettes as tobacco products. But also, we're now more than three years away from the Cetera decision that we just discussed in the last slide, and we're still waiting to see what form um, those regulations will take. It's also important to note that when the regulations are proposed, um, they would not take effect for some, quite some time because the administrative process will, will, um, will take um, certainly more than a year or two to go into effect. So and, until that point, it's, it's, it's really the onus is going to be on the state and local governments to regulate them. So that leads us again with state and local laws. At this point, about half of the states have um, laws that specifically regulate um, e-cigarette sales or prohibit sales to minors. Um, that means that in many states, kids might be able to purchase e-cigarettes legally. There are several states that include e-cigarettes in their smoke-free laws, states like North Dakota, New Jersey, and Utah. Um, and then there are also a lot of local jurisdictions that have enacted res restrictions on e-cigarettes that include things like um, youth access, taxation, point of sale restrictions, and of course, um, including them in their smoke-free laws. Unfortunately, again, as I said, there's just not a comprehensive regulatory scheme in place at this point. So again, we don't know the answer to most of these fundamental questions. What's the, you know, what's the overall public health impact of e-cigarette use? Um, do e-cigarettes promote cessation and help smokers quit, or are they promoting experimentation or initiation or dual use using e-cigarettes um, as an option when one can't smoke but, but continuing to smoke? Um, we just don't know the answer to the question. Earlier this month, uh, the American Journal of Preventive Medicine published a longitudinal study of young adults in Minnesota, and that showed that a significant number of former smokers, it was about 12%, um, these are former smokers who hadn't smoked in the last 30 days, were reintroduced to nicotine through vaping over the term of the study, which is about one year. And the study also showed that there was an association between those who believed that e-cigarettes were less harmful and increased use. Again, not that surprising. If you think they're less harmful, you're probably more likely um, to, to use them. In addition, um, again, as I talked about the CDC study before, which shows that there's a, a, a doubling of use by kids um, over the, between 2011 and 2012. We know that, that more kids are using them. And then we also see, you know, which hasn't happened in a long time, I think there's this coolness factor which has become associated with these cigarettes um, where we see Leonardo DiCaprio vaping at the Golden Globes. Um, we can only assume that the, the, the numbers are going to probably increase. So since our other speakers are going to provide some in-depth information related to specific regulatory options, I'm going to just mention a few of the key areas in which we, our, our offices, have provided legal technical assistance, and we've, um, we've been certainly very, very busy um, providing uh, this type of assistance to local and state jurisdictions. 
Um, and these include youth access, prohibiting kids from purchasing e-cigarettes and, and e-juice products, um, including them in, in, um, in taxation, uh, including some tax parity with other tobacco products, um, including the smoke-free laws, um, requiring that e-cigarette retailers also have a tobacco um, license, and then a variety of point-of-sale options that include things like prohibiting sampling, discounts, um, restricting the types of flavors that can be sold, and then other types of marketing restrictions. And from our perspective, we encourage you to get assistance in the front end if um, on any type of legislation to make sure that whatever your proposed law is, that it fits in both with your existing legal structure and that the definitions that you're using accurately reflect the products that you're intent intending to regulate. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Chris Thokos, who's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. This is Chris Sokis, and I just wanted to do a, a quick uh, title update. Um, I used to be the supervisor for the Alcohol and Tobacco Unit at the Minnesota Department of Health, and we've had a little bit of a staffing shift, and we have a new supervisor of that unit, uh, Jean Carl, and I am now the supervisor of the Community Initiatives Unit here, which encompasses our statewide health improvement program, um, which works on reducing obesity as well as uh, tobacco use and exposure. Um, so in Minnesota, I'm going to talk mostly about our uh, experience around taxing e-cigarettes. Um, I understand that Minnesota is the only state that has done that so far. And um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, in that context, um, I would like to mention that in um, 2010, we had the Tobacco Modernization and Compliance Act, which did address um, not allowing minors to purchase e-cigarettes. So um, that was kind of the backdrop, and then we moved into a broader um, tax campaign. So I will give you a little bit of background on the broader tax campaign, and then we'll kind of hone in on um, our efforts around e-cigarettes. Um, so for the, the name of our coalition, we had a, a large coalition effort with 30 plus organizations working on raising the tobacco tax. Um, raising the tax for health purposes was our primary message. Um, we agreed to um, not take a position on how any revenue should be spent. And so um, we we really had a the a, a really great strong coalition, and that is um, I think an important backdrop here. I'm sorry, I'm trying to advance the slide. There we go. Um, so just for a timeline, um, 2011 is really when. Uh, Minnesota started working on uh, a really focused uh, effort of raising the tobacco tax. Um, that's when the coalition Raise It for Health was uh, created. And in 2012, really focused on um, an education year, building awareness, looking for opportunities. Um, then we had this little thing called an election. And 2013 was kind of a, a new day for us. And the coalition saw an environment that was really going to be conducive. There was uh, public support as well as a change in the legislature. Um, so we really focused in on tobacco tax. Um, the coalition goal was to increase tobacco tax, the cigarette tax, by $1.50 a pack. And um, we had pretty high support in our polling and really tried to focus in on what $1.50 would get us in, in, by way of um, health gains. Um, our governor, Mark Dayton, he was initially unsupportive of, of tobacco tax increase. And um, he was pretty concerned. He, one of the, the concerns that he raised um, frequently was his concern about the tax being regressive. Um, he did not want to impose a uh, burden on low-income Minnesotans. Um, so that's kind of the backdrop that we, we started out with. Um, we were very lucky, and we still are very lucky because he's still our commissioner, but our commissioner of health is, um, he's been a longtime champion in the areas of both um, alcohol and tobacco prevention. And he's very well versed and he's very um, 
willing to be a spokesperson on our issues. And so we, we had a great champion in our Commissioner of Health, and he really did a lot to educate the governor. And the governor has publicly um, in media interviews and in other venues um, really acknowledged the commissioner as being the, the primary reason that he changed his mind eventually on the tobacco tax and recognizing the public health benefit um, outweighing any of his concerns. Uh, another area in, in our efforts to educate the governor were really that we have uh, the LAMP program here in Minnesota, uh, the Leadership and Advocacy Institute to advance Minnesota's parity for priority populations. And this is really uh, uh, an effort to create policy champions and um, tobacco health champions, tobacco prevention champions in the populations of color and the LGBT community as well. And so those uh, policy champions um, signed a letter to the governor trying to address his concerns about um, tobacco tax being a regressive tax. Uh, the results, the, the governor did say, t change his mind, and he inserted a tobacco tax in his budget. Um, the coalition was going for $1.50. The governor um, put in a $0.94 cent increase in his um, budget proposal. So that really created the importance of that is that as a state health department, having that increase in the governor's budget really gave us a platform to be able to speak out about the, the tobacco tax, really be a champion for its benefits. Um, we were really able to use our commissioner in a variety of ways through media and through testimony, um, all sorts of, of freedom that gave us. And then the last piece of information, um, we had the House and the Senate came in with their own proposals for tobacco tax, the Senate at $0.94 cents and the House at $1.60. So how did e-cigarettes get included in the mix of this broad uh, tobacco tax campaign? Um, it really boils down to the previous speaker talked about definitions, and that's really what it boiled down to. Um, we went through the Tobacco Modernization and Compliance Act, was passed in 2010, and that was really an effort to do some housekeeping and update um, our definitions in our existing statutes, um, cleaned up a few things. That's where we were able to address um, uh, eliminating sales of e-cigarettes to minors. And then based on those definitions, it really was serendipity. We, um, you know, there was a great momentum around this, all of this discussion of tobacco tax. Um, it, we were all over the place. The coalition did a fantastic job getting earned media, social media, um, providing testimony, direct uh, lobbying to many of legislators who had um, specific concerns that we were able to address, very positive public opinion polling. And then there were a couple of days at the Capitol that really focused on this um, tobacco tax increase as well. Um, our tobacco tax bills were broader than just cigarette tax increase. Uh, the bills really focused on um, closing the little cigar loophole. It changed the definition of cigarettes to include little cigars. It created a minimum tax on moist snuff. And it taxed premium cigars. And then lastly, it also increased the tax on other tobacco products. So within that um, area of the bills, uh, the tax on other tobacco products, which we were considering to be chewing tobacco, snooze, dissolvables, and then the nicotine cartridges in e-cigarettes. And the proposed um, uh, the legislation ended up um, increasing from 70% of wholesale price to 95% of wholesale price. Um, but this really pointed back to the definition that was in our Tobacco Compliance and Modernization Act. And the Department of Revenue really just picked up that definition. They said this is where people landed, this is the definition they chose, and um, that's what we're going to focus on. And so. When you look at our, this is just a snippet of our uh, tobacco products definition, and it included, and where the Department of Revenue really focused in on was the key phrase in the statute um, that established the taxability of an e-cigarette is that it's any product containing, made, or derived from tobacco, 
and whether it's smoked or inhaled or any component or accessory of a tobacco product. And so that's really where the Department of Revenue hung its hat, and it just went on through. Um, the Department of Revenue, you know, we have done a pretty good job. You know, we, we don't work with them on a real regular basis, but I will say that um, Clearway Minnesota, which is our um, tobacco foundation in our state, and the Minnesota Department of Health both had periodic check-ins with the Department of Revenue trying to talk about tax issue, tobacco tax issues. Um, but bottom line, the Department of Revenue applied the solid definition of tobacco products, which included e-cigarettes, to the tax law. Um, so our lesson and takeaway from that was really to do a good job. We worked closely with the Public Health Law Center. Um, Susan Wiseman was the one that we worked with there. But um, really getting a solid definition that, um, you know, that was 2010 and this carried us through to 2013. So what have we learned since implementing the tobacco tax? Um, we did have a follow-up meeting. I met, uh, a couple of us met with the Department of Revenue and had a nice conversation about how is it going um, and how, do, how can we help you um, if you need any help. And what's interesting is that um, one thing that we learned is Department of Revenue does have field auditors. Um, they don't just sit and wait for the tobacco tax checks to come rolling in and for people to pay. They, um, they really just uh, uh, get out there and they do some spot checks and are um, really looking at the inventory that people have and having conversations with retailers who are paying these taxes. And um, a couple of things uh, surfaced. So the Department of Revenue said that they were getting some pushback from retailers saying that the nicotine, um, you know, well, as the Department of Revenue went out, um, not all of the bottles of nicotine juice were labeled. Many of them just had a flavor across the, um, uh, on the label. Um, I've gone into several of the um, e-cig shops and seen the same thing. Some of them do have um, ingredients listed on the, the bottle, but there were several instances where the juice just said cotton candy or espresso. And then sometimes there would be a little line um, where someone would write with a Sharpie, 18 mg or 8 mg. Um, and so there was really pretty great variability as far as us knowing what's in them. Um, uh, the other things that people were hearing, the, that the Department of Revenue was hearing as they went out in the field is that retailers were saying, uh, well, this nicotine isn't derived from tobacco, therefore it can't be taxed. Our, uh, they were actually hearing that uh, the nicotine juice that some folks were um, supplying was derived from tomatoes. Um, and they were giving them product sheets that were very lengthy and asking them to just read this sheet and you'll find out that our product is not tobacco derived. Um, many of the product sheets were not in English, and so there were a lot of challenges in the implementation of, um, there are a lot of uh, pushback, I guess, from, um, the, for the field auditors. Um, based on this pushback, the Department of Revenue sort of went back and regrouped, and they did write up an official uh, position that ha has helped them quite a bit. And the Department's position really boils down to e-cigarettes are subject to the tobacco products tax. The cartridge containing nicotine is a component of the e-cigarette. The cartridges contain nicotine, which is ordinarily derived from tobacco and is used by a person uh, by smoking or inhaling them. And the department assumes that all nicotine is derived from tobacco and the taxpayer will bear the burden of proving otherwise. And so it really kind of turned it around to say, um, you know, I'm not just going to believe you that yours is derived from a tomato. You're really going to have to put together some kind of documentation. Um, the department's position also said that um, if a wholesaler sells the cartridge separately and can isolate the cost of the product, so the, the juice bottles versus the delivery device, um, the tax will be imposed only on the nicotine-based cartridge or liquid. 
Um, otherwise, the sales price of a whole kit or uh, content of an eSig package will be taxed. So that's kind of where they landed based on questions as they initially went out to implement this tax. Um, you know, there's been ongoing discussion in Minnesota about regulation of e-cigarettes. We get lots of questions coming in um, to the department every day. I've taken a couple of calls from people who um, identify themselves as juice mixers or juice manufacturers, um, people who are expanding their business from um, putting these products together in a, a garage to actually uh, developing in a warehouse. And they um, the couple of calls that I have taken have really sort of expected to be regulated, and they were calling to seek out that regulation. What are the rules, and how do I follow them? And at this point, we, we don't have anything like that. Um, so you know, there's lots of discussion going on. Um, we are um, certainly having many discussions across the state around um, licensing, um, self-service displays, applying e-cigarettes to the Minnesota Clean and Door Air Act. And then concerning the, the bottles of juice, um, you know, we're talking about we do have an ingredient disclosure law in Minnesota. Um, it, it's not very extensive. It requires annual reporting on five ingredients. Um, but we've been talking about, you know, we do hear frequently from vapors and from um, e-cig folks that you know that the product is perfectly safe, and so I mean we would love to have ingredient disclosure of some sort or some sort of labeling that's consistent that allows consumers to make uh, educated decisions. And so we've been having those discussions as well. So as those discussions are going on, and the state is deciding if it wants to take action or um, if legislators want to take action, um, local cities and counties are moving forward as they always do. And we in Minnesota have 25 cities and two counties that have updated their tobacco ordinances to reflect new products, including nicotine and labelia delivery devices, so e-cigarettes essentially. And those restrictions or updates can include licensing and eliminating sampling. Uh, three cities have updated their indoor air ordinances to include e-cigarettes, and so that's exciting as well that the local folks are saying, you know what, we're not going to wait for the FDA, we're not going to wait for the state, we want to address this in our community. So that has been Minnesota's experience to date. Um, here's my contact information, and I will turn the slide deck over to Scott Neal who is our next speaker. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. My name is Scott Neal. I manage the Tobacco Prevention Program for Public Health Seattle King County. And we've actually sort of been fortunate enough um, through a policy opportunity a few years ago to have e-cigarette regulations um, adopted early on in the e-cigarette in the e sort of days. So our, our, um, our e-cigarette policy adventure really began in early 2010 when our Board of Health identified a, a tobacco subcommittee to review evidence and develop a new and propose new tobacco policies that could respond to current challenges and opportunities that were facing us in King County. Um, we worked closely with the subcommittee along with our prosecuting attorney's office uh, to consider a variety of tobacco-related policies, e-cigarettes being just one of them that we addressed that year. Um, during this time, we were fortunate to have Ann Pearson, who some of you may be familiar with, with, who came from to us. She's a public health attorney who came to us from New York City Tobacco Prevention Control Program and now manages the Tobacco Prevention Program at Change Lab Solutions. So she was instrumental in helping us uh, craft sort of the, the policy once the, the board decided where to go. We, we uh, c also connected directly with the, the folks at the, at the Tobacco Control Legal Consortium, um, who are always a great resource for anyone considering tobacco policy. The committee determined, one of the first things they did is determined that electronic cigarettes did not fall into our, the definition of a tobacco product by our state law. So therefore, no, none of the provisions regulating tobacco apply to e-cigarettes in Washington. The good news was because it was not considered tobacco, we weren't preempted by the state law and therefore could take local action around the, the sale of these products. We actually have quite a restrictive preemption uh, on the retail sale of any tobacco products um, in our state, so we can't take local action on the sale or promotion of those products within the retail, retail end. Um, 
but because these products weren't tobacco, by definition, we could actually uh, take local action. It's also an important, um, in our uh, journey, it was also important to understand today, the landscape back in 2010 was a bit different around e-cigarettes than it is today. At the time, e-cigarettes were primarily available uh, locally here at a few shopping mall kiosks or online or at a hand, handful of convenience stores. Typically, um, they were quite expensive, at least $20 to, uh, at the low end. To Most of them, the products range from $50 to $100 for a starter kit. Uh, and then we were also beginning to see e-cigarettes being used in bars, coffee shops, and other public places uh, that didn't, uh, and because they weren't def defined as a tobacco product or, or smoking because it's a vapor, they didn't fall under our sort of longstanding um, uh, smoking ban in the state. We even, um, we even were receiving a lot of complaints and questions regarding their public use by bar owners and restaurants and the public wanting to know if these were legal to be used in a bar because people had seen that in those products being used. And, and then bartenders were, were when we, we actually do the secondhand smoke inspections for our state's smoking law. And so we were, we were facing a lot of questions from bar owners asking about, well, when, they, when my clients use e-cigarettes, then other people want to start smoking, and I have to you know, have all kinds of problems with trying to regulate that in the, in the business. And so that became a, a kind of a complicated enforcement process for us. Um, the e-cigarette industry was also still very small by comparison, and they were very little known about these products at the time. So the Board of Health, um, after months of work and link lengthy Board of Health hearing, they, pa they did pass unanimously the current uh, e -ci electronic cigarette and nicotine delivery product regulations. Um, on this slide deck, I've actually linked 19.12. Uh, so when this is up online following the, the uh, webinar today, hopefully you'll be able to actually click through and actually access that. If not, you can, anyone can feel free to, to look at it on our website or contact me directly. Um, but that, that was passed in December 2, 2010, and the regulations essentially set the minimum legal age for purchasing these products to 18 years of age. Uh, this was a very important at the time because at the, t um, the, state did not, the state law did not recognize e-cigarettes as tobacco products, so there was no official restrictions limiting the sale of these products to minors. It also prohibited the sampling of these products, restricted vending machines to adult-only venues, and restricted coupons to be used only in face-to-face -face transactions, which was much the same way that the state law already restricted these items around tobacco. By far, though, obviously, the, the most controversial piece of the, was the prohibition of the use of electronic smoking devices from public places and places of employment. Um, and in our definitions, buildings open to the public is what we call a public place. So you, you, these can still be used, obviously, out you know, in public, uh, per se. And places of employment included any place that employees are present, essentially you know, pulling from the state law's smoking ban um, definitions. So although there are a lot, lot more e-cigarette users and proponents today, I do still think there's still a lot of uncertainty around the e-cigarettes. The FDA still has not taken action on, to regulate these products, and none of these products have been FDA tested or approved as safe and effective cessation devices. So I think that there is still an ample opportunity to take local action to address the, the sale and use of e-cigarettes. Um, when we did this, we did learn quite a bit, so I'll go over some of the lessons learned. Obviously, one of the th items that has been shared already today a couple of times uh, was around definitions, and I can't stress this enough. Good definitions are key to a successful regulation. There are a wide variety of electronic smoking devices on the market today and likely even more tomorrow. Many of these products don't even resemble a traditional cigarette any longer. Um, and you, will feel, you, you all will fare best if you keep the policy rationale focused on preventing youth access and use. For instance, youth access to e-cigarettes can at least lead to a lifetime nicotine addiction, and at worst uh, could lead towards traditional tobacco products, as been, has been discussed already today. Um, a focal point should be on preventing uh, initiation directly from you know, sales promotions, but also could include keeping the social norm gains we've seen from smoke-free laws in many of our states or local jurisdictions. If you do take up the issue of public use res restrictions, be sure to make it clear that restricting the use does not equal banning the product. That was something that was brought up during our hearing quite a bit by e-cigarette proponents and users, and that just simply is not true. Uh, folks can use the product just like they can uh, cigarettes as well. These products can still be sold and used in public places, or just not used in public places or places of, in, in, uh, places of employment. 
Uh, one thing to remember is that you're going to expect to get vocal testimony from a variety of e-cigarette supporters. Even back in 2010, we had a representative from the Consumer Advocates for Smoke-Free Alternatives Association show up and testify. They support youth restrictions, as do many proponents, but do not tend to support the use restrictions in public places or places of employment. Their testimony, along with everyday users that swear that they've quit by using e-cigarettes, will, will tear at policy heart, policymakers' heartstrings. Um, and expect uh, people to testify and ask the question, why restrict one product, the one product that has saved my life? I mean, we heard that a lot at the, during the hearing. So our advice was to make sure that to anyone who's maybe considering these type of restrictions would be to make sure that you've got your proponents uh, coming to the table as well to, to share the, the benefits and need for this in, in your community. Um, our Board of Health ultimately did decide to use a precautionary principle to adopt regulations to protect public health since the product contents and the sale and promotion was not regulated and still is not by the FDA. Um, and I recognize that passing the same re restrictions today may be even more controversial today given the, the widespread use of these products and growing e-cigarette industry. However, I do think that, um, that that whole issue can be spun around and used in your favor. Three years ago, Big Tobacco was on the fringe of jumping into the e-cigarette movement, and today all major manufacturers either have or will soon have products available on the market. And in fact, it's no surprise that the advertising and marketing techniques that they are using today mimic those that they used decades ago with traditional cigarettes. So while there may be some significant opposition to e-cigarette regulations, many jurisdictions are successful at adopting them. And um, I think we'll hear next from um, Kendall Stagg from the Department or Chicago Department of Health. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Um, real quick housekeeping issues before I start. Um, I am a licensed attorney, but I have to disclose that I am not your lawyer and that nothing in my presentation is legal advice. And if you have legal questions, you really should consult with your own lawyer. Um, also, I am not a doctor, and nothing in this presentation is medical advice. If you have questions about your health, consult with your doctor. So that being said, um, I'm really excited to share with everyone today that we had big news in Chicago last week. Um, the city of Chicago overwhelmingly passed an ordinance to regulate e-cigarettes. The vote was 45 to 4. Um, the passage of this ordinance took several months. It was a hard-fought battle. Um, it certainly, I think, was probably more difficult than what Seattle went through just because um, there are so many e-cigarette users now and they were very organized. Um, we hope that by sharing our story uh, with you today that other cities and towns can learn from our experience and successfully p pursue similar strategies. Um, let me start off by giving you a quick summary of what we did in Chicago. Um, right now in Chicago, because the new ordinance has not been implemented yet, cigarettes have to be behind the counter, out of the reach of children. That is not true of e-cigarettes. Right now in Chicago, stores have to have a special license to sell cigarettes and other addictive tobacco products. That is not true of e-cigarettes. And in Chicago, retailers that sell cigarettes to kids can be fined or have their license revoked. Again, these penalties do not apply to retailers who sell e-cigarettes to kids. And in fact, if we found someone knowingly selling uh, e-cigarettes to children, we would not have the legal authority to revoke their license. Um, the new uh, ordinance in Chicago on e-cigarettes that just passed last week will fix all of these problems. The other thing this ordinance did is it includes e-cigarettes in the Chicago Clean Indoor Air Act. What that means is that their use is going to be limited in most indoor areas and cannot be used within 15 feet of building entrances. We worked very hard with res uh, representatives from Chicago's vibrant theater community to allow for an exemption that actors who are on a live stage or theater uh, could continue to use e-cigarettes. Um, and we also worked to carve out an exemption so that e-cigarette stores or vaping shops fall under the exact same uh, exemptions that already existed for cig cigar shops and hookah shops. It's basically a parallel of existing laws around tobacco. So that's what the ordinance is. Let's talk about what it is not. Um, this is not a ban. The truth is, is that even after this ordinance goes into effect, e-cigarettes can still be sold at more than 3,000 retailers that are already licensed to sell tobacco products, and they can be used privately uh, in, in your own home or in outdoor settings. They can be used either as a lifestyle choice or as a cessation device if that's how you want to try to quit. Um, even opponents from Chicago's 
uh, excuse me, even opponents of the new ordinance in Chicago, um, ultimately seemed to agree that it was necessary to protect kids by regulating the sale and distribution of e-cigarettes. So today I'm going to focus most of my time discussing the rationale for including e-cigarettes in the Chicago Clean and Door Air Act. And specifically I'll talk about three different concerns. One, that e-cigarette vapors are not risk-free. Two, uh, normalize or renormalization of smoking. And three, how e-cigarettes impact enforcement efforts of the Chicago Clean and Door Air Act. Unlike uh, other cities that easily passed restrictions on e-cigarettes, um, I, I do think that our experience here in Chicago was not so easy. Um, we can talk a lot about how these products are different from combustible cigarettes, but what was really not different for us was the ferocity of the debate. It was very similar to the very vigorous debate and tactics that we experienced when we first passed the Chicago Clean and Door Air Law. Um, I, I, just, I can tell you, lobbyists and, and, and vapors absolutely inundated City Hall. And their favorite talking point was that e-cigarettes are, quote, safe, and that vapor comes, uh, coming out of the e-cigarette is just water vapor. Um, our number one goal was to assure Chicago's aldermen that it is not just water vapor. The vapor from virtually all e-cigarettes contain propylene glycol, which is a known respiratory irritant. And when oxidized, the propylene glycol can create formaldehyde and acetaldehyde. Excuse me, acetaldehyde. I need water. Hang on just a second. We also discussed with Chicago's aldermen that laboratory tests have confirmed vapor from e-cigarettes contain things like glycerin, tiny pieces of tin part particles, aluminum, iron, nickel, arsenic, copper, lead, carcinogenic compounds, and volatile organic compounds. All of these things can be harmful to your health, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. It was actually impossible for us to list all of the chemicals and health concerns associated with these cigarettes onto just one slide. So instead, uh, our health commissioner, Dr. Bashara Shukar, would use word maps like this one to paint a much more accurate picture for Chicago's aldermen. During committee hearings, we went armed with written testimony from the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, as well as the Ameri American Academy of Pediatrics, and their testimony did cite numerous academic studies that raised serious questions about the safety of e-cigarettes. We also provided Chicago's aldermen with a literature review that illustrates it is not just water vapor. Opponents were finally forced to admit that it's not just water vapor, but they cried foul, and they argued that these substances only appear in small amounts. And let me just say right now, they're right. They're absolutely right, and I am absolutely confident that e-cigarettes are indeed safer than combustible cigarettes. But the truth is, you could say that about every single consumer good on the market. Any consumer good, when used as directed, is safer than a combustible cigarette. That does not mean it is risk-free, and safer is not the same thing as safe. Sadly, this really was the kind of debate that we had last week, though, in City Hall. Another favorite talking point is that e-cigarettes do not appear to present an immediate significant health hazard when inhaled. Some people even tried the e-cigarette right there in City Hall and then proclaimed, I feel fine. So, again, our health commissioner, Dr. Bashar Shukar, had to explain that just like when smoking first became popular, the use of combustible cigarettes did not appear to present a significant health hazard. Just a few decades ago, doctors even endorsed cigarettes in advertisements and took us 15 to 20 years before we discovered the direct link between smoking and lung cancer. The health commissioner had to explain that this is known as a latency period, and the truth is that we could very well be in a latency period right now. We simply do not know the long-term health effects of inhaling propylene glycol or any of the other substances contained in e-cigarettes. Commissioner Shukar also had to explain that e-cigarette vapors have been found to contain volatile organic compounds that are hazardous to health. These compounds, when found in almost any other product, are usually regulated by law and especially indoors but that is not true of these cigarettes. And the harmful, volatile organic compounds typically found in products are not acutely toxic. But just because something is not acutely toxic does not mean it is safe. Volatile organic compounds have compounding long-term health effects, and because the concentrations are usually low and the symptoms are slow to develop, research into these compounds and their effects is difficult. But let's be clear, these chemicals are far from water vapor and emission of these chemicals in the air is concerning, and it did concern the Chicago City Council. 
We also had to refute that pollutants coming from e-cigarettes are always less than tobacco smoke. While I actually think that is true, um, some e-cigarette vapors contain more metals than tobacco smoke. One study found that concentrations of aluminum, iron, nickel, and sodium were higher in e-cigarette aerosol than in regular cigarette smoke. The same study found that e-cigarette aerosol contains equal concentration of uh, chromium, copper, magnesium, and lead as regular tobacco smoke. While the concentration of these chemicals are usually less than in tobacco smoke, we still maintain that these vapors are a new source of fine particles in the indoor environment, and continuously breathing air that contains fine or ultra-fine particle matter is a health concern. And for that reason alone, the Chicago Department of Public Health maintains that until more is known about these products, e-cigarettes should not be used in public places, restaurants and bars, or in private office buildings where people have to work. It's also important for us to point out that many of these products are made overseas, and regardless of whether they are made here in the U.S. or in China, there are absolutely no restrictions imposed on the types of chemicals or ingredients that manufacturers can use or cannot use, and there are no restrictions on the kinds of chemicals e-cigarettes can emit into the indoor environment, limiting their use, especially when they remain unregulated by the FDA, is just good common sense. There are also serious problems with quality control, which I think we heard earlier, and accurate labeling. But I'll go over this slide just because it does provide a citation for some folks to look up. Uh, E-cigarettes contain various levels of nicotine concentration, and manufacturers do not always accurately label the amount of nicotine in their products. This recent study of 35 major brands found that only 10 of the brands had labels that accurately listed the amount of nicotine delivered. Other research shows that this variation can occur even within the same brand. Some e-cigarettes claim to be nicotine-free, yet have been found to actually contain nicotine. Last week in his testimony, my health commissioner, Bashar Shakir, also pointed out that as a physician, he finds this variability very alarming. Something that is billed as a cessation device should never have this kind of product variability. Unfortunately, this kind of variability occurs because these products are completely unregulated. The variability of nicotine levels in e-cigarettes is also alarming because a very large amount of nicotine can produce negative health problems, including nicotine poisoning. The FDA has received some reports of adverse events related to e-cigarettes, and poison control centers are also reporting an increase in cases of nicotine poisoning. Of course, as I mentioned before, the other side hired uh, lobbyists and they inundated City Hall and they presented very conflicting information, which made policymakers, I'm sure, feel very conflicted about the science. No doubt I agree that the body of evidence is not as robust as any of us would like it to be, and it will probably be many more years before we reach scientific consensus. Because there is no scientific consensus, at least not yet, in Chicago this issue really boiled down to a question of credibility. Ultimately, Chicago aldermen were asked who they trust, do you trust uh, doctors, some of the most trusted names in health and medicine, to provide you and your constituents with important health information? Do you side with the American Academy of Family Physicians, the Academy of Pediatrics, the Institute of Medicine of Chicago? Or do you trust the tobacco companies that deliberately lied about the safety of light, low-tar, slim, and so-called natural tobacco products? Do you trust the e-cigarette companies that actually were represented in C City Hall, the same ones that refused to submit safety information to the FDA and sued the FDA, blocking them in court when they tried to regulate these products like a drug delivery device? The same companies that then came to City Hall and duplicitly, duplicitously said that we should wait in City Hall to regulate these products because the FDA should act first, even though they delayed FDA action. Do you trust a national industry trade group that masquerades as a grassroots organization? I see there are folks from CASA online on this webinar, and let me tell you right now, if you are going down this road, you need to warn your policymakers that they will receive Twitter bombing from this group. They will get hundreds of tweets from organizations and individuals in New York and Texas, even though these states might be thousands of miles away. Of course, I work for a health department, and so it's no surprise that we side with the most trusted names in health and medicine.
But in case there is any question left in anyone's mind, you can take the e-cigarette industry at their own word. Enjoy and Mark 10 have warning labels on their product that identify them as, quote, toxic when inhaled. Both companies also have warning labels that clearly state this product is not a cessation product and has not been tested as such. Metro e-cigarettes has a very similar warning. In addition, Metro also has warnings that say, quote, vapors may cause drowsiness or dizziness, and if you feel unwell, seek medical advice, and this product contains a chemical known to cause birth defects or other reproductive harm. With warnings like these, it really is difficult to believe the industry is saying that there's absolutely no cause for concern. The truth is these vapors have not been proven safe, and there's more evidence to suggest that protection of clean indoor air is warranted. The other uh, reason, the second reason that we gave uh, to uh, our city council for including e-cigarettes in the Chicago Clean Indoor Air Act is renormalization of smoking. We are very concerned that the widespread use of e-cigarettes is indeed renormalizing, if not flat-out glamorizing, smoking. On the floor, just before a final vote uh, took place, Alderman Moreno shared an incredibly touching story about what changed his mind on this debate. He told us that his daughter could not stop staring at a vapor in a restaurant, and that he tried to explain to her that this was different. No matter how hard he tried, he could not explain to her in a way that she could understand, and his daughter continued to stare. He asked what message this sends to children who probably do not understand the difference, and I'll tell you, it really was powerful testimony. And the third rationale for including e-cigarettes in the Chicago Clean Indoor Air Act is that these products have the potential to undermine our existing clean indoor air enforcement efforts. Because they were intentionally developed to mimic the act of smoking, it makes enforcement of the clean indoor air law more difficult. In Chicago, we had restaurant owners provide testimony in favor of the ordinance. They openly admitted that it was confusing and that bartenders and waiters and bouncers sometimes do have difficulty telling these products apart, especially from across the room. The restaurant industry also emphasized that they want to focus on providing an enjoyable dining experience rather than being relegated to mediating discussions of patrons being placed near other patrons using an e-cigarette. I imagine this is why many Fortune 500 companies like Starbucks and Marriott have made a decision, a business decision, to not allow e-cigarettes on their premises, and why numerous airlines are making business decisions to voluntarily begin announcements on their flights that no smoking is allowed, including e-cigarettes. Although these companies were probably not thinking about health when they made these business decisions, I do agree with their assessment. Ease of enforcement is a serious concern, and Chicago's new ordinance on e-cigarettes is both good for business and good for health. In Chicago, the other favorite talking point for people who opposed regulation of e-cigarettes was that they are helpful in smoking cessation and that we are regulating a helpful product right out of business. First, let me say that we are skeptical that something flavored like cotton candy is a cessation device. And their own ads and product labels make it clear these devices are not for quitting. The truth is, for every study that suggests e-cigarette aids uh, can help with cessation, uh, there's more studies that claim that the products are being used as a bridge or dual-use device a product that allows cigarette smokers to continue to smoke in places where it's prohibited, which impedes with tobacco cessation efforts. And worse, there's mounting evidence now that these are indeed starter products for kids. When the FDA asked the industry to submit documents on product safety, they sued. So far, e-cigarette companies have not provided any documentation regarding product safety or whether these products are a good cessation device. The truth is we simply don't know. But that's really not relevant here. This debate is not about that, and discussions about whether or not they are good for cessation is a huge distraction. The truth is people can still use these products as a lifestyle choice, or if they want, they can even try it as a cessation device. We are not affecting the harm reduction properties of this product by merely asking people to take it outside. Again, even after this ordinance is implemented, there will still be more than 3,000 retailers in Chicago who are already licensed to sell e-cigarettes, and e-cigarettes will continue to be sold at a price point that is much, much lower than combustible cigarettes, which creates a large financial incentive for people to make the switch. Even in Minnesota, who you heard from earlier, 
they tax these at a rate less than combustible cigarettes, creating a financial incentive for people to make the switch. To say that we are regulating these products out of existence simply is not true. Again, whether or not these products are being used as a cessation device is not relevant to a discussion about whether or not there is a strong public health rationale for including e-cigarettes in smoke-free policies. The City of Chicago thinks there is, and last week, in a 45 to 4 vote, the City Council agreed by passing a law because they know that there is a growing body of evidence that outlines numerous safety concerns with e-cigarettes. They know that allowing e-cigarettes to renormalize smoking has the potential to reverse decades of progress and negatively impact public health. And they know that enforcement problems are being created by e-cigarettes and threatens the Chicago Clean and Door Air Act. I see that I'm getting short on time, so I'm going to skip my last two slides. But just let me say in closing that restricting the use of e-cigarettes in public places is an approach that incorporates the most basic principle of medicine, do no harm. It also incorporates one of the most basic principles of the public health profession, the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle requires, in the absence of scientific consensus, the burden of proving that vaping is not harmful to others should fall on those promoting the activity. And that is why the Chicago City Council voted just last week, again, 54 to 4, to include these products in the Chicago Clean and Door Air Act. Um, you can see the rest of my slides and the handouts that will be sent out. With that, I will conclude um, my portion of this presentation. Wow, well, thank you very much, Kendall and Chris and Scott. Uh, that was really interesting. I think everybody appreciates hearing um, you know, the, the, the stories firsthand from the, from the local level and, and uh, the policy rationales and, um, and the implementation strategies. Um, I don't have much to add to it um, in conclusion here, but I thought I would just, just run through um, some key issues from our perspective as we you know, provide legal advice or legal technical assistance, I should say, um, uh, to state and local governments as they're implementing policies. Um, and much of these, I think, are, are, are almost redundant from what, um, what our speakers went through and, and described today um, in much, much more detail. Um, but first of all, I, I, to be sure before um, implementing any, any um, new law to make sure that you have adequate legal authority. Um, and part of that is to make sure that you're not preempted, as, uh, as Scott talked a lot about that. Um, from Seattle King County, um, ensuring that um, state law doesn't um, prohibit a local government from from um, taking any um, any legal steps um, that they want to take uh, um, to prohibit or to to um, restrict the sale of e-cigarettes. Um, and also make sure that it fits fits uh, within your own legal framework. Uh, most important thing, and I think this is this kind of ran through everybody's uh, presentations today, is to make sure that you have very, very clear definitions and concise language, um, ensuring that you are regulating exactly what you want to regulate. And I think Kendall talked a lot about this um, in his presentation. Um, you know, some of the things to think about are if you're, if you're restricting um, definitions to, to solely nicotine-based products, how that would work when, when it comes to enforcing if, for example, it's in a smoke-free law, um, how the, the enforcement um, entities on the ground level are going to be able to make that determination of whether something includes nicotine or not. Um, also with these cigarette laws, um, not to mention the fact that I think as we, we talked also, um, I think also Kendall was talking about um, the studies that show that those that, um, that say they don't contain nicotine may actually um, be shown to have, contain, to, to have nicotine in them. Um, and finally, working within your existing legal structure, within your existing legal structure, excuse me, I can't speak. Um, model laws are great tools, but they also need to be tailored um, for every jurisdiction. Um, and finally, to make sure that there's robust enforcement options and a well-planned and um, articulated implementation process for any um, any new laws. I encourage you to, um, to to stop by our website sometime. We have a number of um, publications that are available that provide some, uh, some tips and some tools for um, things you can think about when um, drafting laws and, um, and give some, some um, other examples from different jurisdictions as well. My information is here. You can feel free to contact me um, and my colleagues here. We do a lot of work on this and we'd be happy to talk to you 
Um, you know, again, as I said before, we we prefer to talk in the front end as much as possible um, to to give some be a kind of a sounding board for what we think are are um, the best ways to draft different kinds of, of laws. So with that, I want to thank everybody for your time, and I'm going to turn this um, back over to Jennifer for some question and answer, I believe. Great. Thank you, Mark. And thank you uh, to all of our speakers today for such great information that you shared with us all. I think uh, one thing that I would like to say is that we know we have a lot of questions that have come in during the presentations today. And we just would like to let everyone know that to the extent that we uh, are able, if we don't get to your question during the um, presentation today, we will try to answer as many as we possibly can through a Q&A document that we will put together after the call. So thank you. So at this time, we'll begin the Q&A session. If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the chat box located on your screen. And we have a few questions that have come in already. So one of the first questions that I'd like to um, address, actually Mark, this is just in reference to some of the slides that you had up at the beginning. Were your statistics just referencing uh, the United States or those worldwide statistics? Uh, the, well, the, the CDC would be from the United States, and I think I had another um, study that was on just Minnesota um, young adults. So nothing was worldwide. Okay. Um, except for anything the World Health Organization came up with. That wasn't from, that didn't include actual numbers or anything. Okay. Great. Our second question that we have today is actually for Chicago, actually. And we were, the uh, person was just wondering, well, what's the one thing that you wished you knew prior to beginning work on your e-cigarette ordinance? Honestly, I think the one thing that we wish we would have known is just how vigorously um, the other side would be working against this. Um, we, again, we tried to find middle ground. We gave exceptions for vape shops. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure that I think that we think that that's a good idea, um, but it was a compromise. Um, it, we questioned, frankly, whether or not you know creating a, a, a vape shop where people can go in and have you know, coffee and desserts and, and vape is, is really something that should be happening for something billed as a cessation device. But it doesn't matter. We give that exemption to cigar shops. We give that exemption to hookah lounges. And so we thought that we would definitely need to give that exemption for a product like this that is truly, um, you know, less harmful than a combustible. Um, despite our attempts to come to the middle and find middle ground, there was no middle ground. They are extremely organized, um, and they will oppose your ordinance uh, no matter what concessions you give, and folks really need to be prepared for that. Uh, we honestly were not prepared. Great. Thank you, Kendall. Our next question actually is for uh, any one of the presenters who might be willing to address this. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, restaurants in particular, but how about public transportation? Uh, do any of you have any experience with rules being established for the use of e-cigs on buses or trains? Any um, experience dealing with that? Well, because in Chicago we just paralleled our existing uh, Clean Indoor Air Act. Um, that you know, is a very broad restriction that covers um, buses and public transportations. We did not do this in an incremental fashion where we went after, you know, CTA platforms and the buses first. Um, we've just decided that it's going to be a, a universal restriction that we parallel existing uh, clean and air law. We did the same thing in Seattle as well. Yeah, th this is Mark. I think that's what we've seen typically as well, that it generally it's, it's any public vehicle. Um, so it would include more than just um, buses and trains. Great. Thank you. The next question is for Chris in Minnesota. And the question asks, are hookahs or water pipes included in your policy as well? Oh, this, is, this could be a long answer. Um, so in Minnesota, we have a little, we have one loophole in our uh, clean indoor air law that allows for sampling. And um, right now, hookah bars are 
finding their way into uh, municipalities by claiming that hookah use is sampling product. And mind you, these could be you know, 45 minute sampling sessions because we don't have a good definition of sampling. And so it just goes back to good definitions. Um, so no, um, hookah is not included in the tax because, well, no, I don't think that it is included in the tax. And we, we allow them to open up in our clean indoor air laws because of that loophole. So um, that is actually an area that we can, could stand to tighten up. The next question, actually, I think I'll address this one to Mark. Um, the question asks, is there a preference to use the term e-cigarettes or vape or vaping? Have you seen any consistency uh, in the terminology being used with regular um, Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, I, I don't know that it matters so much. I mean, I think we, we've tended to use um, Electronic smoking device was, is typically what we um, we use, but um, I think as long as the definition is comprehensive enough um, to include what you as the jurisdiction wants to include, I don't know that it matters so much. Um, but we try to keep it a little bit broader, I think. And I think that the term, you know, vaping, uh, you know, I, I think vaping actually, if you if you look at it in the dictionary, I'm not even sure that's, that it's, it's considered to be an actual word. Um, a verb. So um, that's for that reason. I think we've 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 tried to use electronic spoken device or something like that. But you know, it's 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 all on how you define it. Okay. Uh, the next question um, has to do with uh, looking at underage sales in states without bans for minors laws. Um, in particular, um, this question says that they get a lot of questions from their uh, legislators. So they're asking if there's any proof of underage sales in states without bans for minors laws. Uh, Mark, I guess I'll address this one to you first. If you yeah, no, I think that's, that's a good question. But but no, I mean because it's not there's there's nobody tracking it, so there wouldn't be any way to have any numbers on it. But the fact that it's that we know that that uh, minors are using them throughout the country, um, it sort of just stands to reason that if um, if they're legal, that they would be or could be purchasing them. Uh, but no, we, there's no. I've not seen any studies personally that um, has tracked that because states don't have. I don't think at this point they have the incentive to expend the resources to study that. Okay. This is Scott in Seattle. We actually have a, another county on the eastern side of Washington that back in 2010 about the same time that we were working with our Board of Health, they actually sent youth out to e-cigarette retailers. And I don't have the exact numbers, don't quote me on this, but it was overwhelming majority of those that tried to buy were, were successful. Um, and that's just obviously one snapshot in time. But it, it's concerning when you look at the CDC numbers of, of youth use going doubling in one year. So the next question we have is for Chris. And this is another uh, question about your uh, definition. Did your tobacco and nicotine definition include nicotine delivery devices? Um, for example, FDA approved cessation devices such as gum, patches, lozenges, or inhalers. Um, I'd have to look at the exact language. Those are, those are uh, addressed. I don't believe that they're, uh, I believe they're exempt from the tobacco law the tobacco tax, um, and are taxed in another category. Um, but it's not, it is, it, they, we explicitly speak to those. Um, what I showed in my slides was just a snippet of our definitions, and those products are called out separately as not taxable as, because they're not considered tobacco products. Great, thank you. So this next question uh, is, um, the question says, in regards to electronic cigarette usage, what advice would you offer for employers that have tobacco-free or smoke-free hiring policies? Uh, so I'll address this one first to um, Kendall in Chicago. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a really tough issue. Um, I, I, my department does not have a, a position on that. Okay. Mark? Do you have any thoughts on that question? 
Well, I, I guess I, I echo Kendall. It, it is a, it's definitely a tough issue, and I think it, it depends on, on um, what the workplace, you know, what the employer wants to do. I mean, there's certainly, you know, it, it would, it sort of a multifaceted question, I think. Um, anytime you get employment issues involved, uh, but if, if there is an existing uh, tobacco-free work por workforce policy, um, it would certainly um, depend on how that's written, what, how tobacco is defined, I guess, in the, in, in the workplace policy. Uh, but I think in, in terms of enforcement, I think regardless of whether it would be, you know, effectively prohibit the use of e-cigarettes, that um, it should be, you know, really clearly um, communicated to any employees before any action is taken so that there's, you know, there's, there's a, a, a clear understanding um, of what the expectations are and what the, the feeling is regarding the policy and how it would be, uh, take effect. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's a, that would that would be a, I think that would be a, a it's a it's a robust question. I, I would probably need more time and probably um, uh, a more information about this specific set of facts in order to give any um, any thoughts on it. Okay. The next question um, asks: So Minnesota and Chicago both had their health commissioners as significant champions. But Scott, um, could you um, talk about the level of involvement with the commissioner in Seattle? Yeah, I mean, our health uh, health commissioner, our health director, is our, our public health di director. He's our health officer and public health director, and he, you know, he was a champion, of course. But really, where it, the support came from, the tobacco subcommittee, which was made up of members of the board of health, and it did include one of our administration administrators of the public health department as well, but. But primarily, the, the, it was the tobacco subcommittee that was interested in moving policy forward, and our director did not have to really chime in too much. So for Seattle, it sounds like the, the committee had a large role. I'd be interested to know, um, both for Minnesota and Chicago, um, were there other local champions that were instrumental in your efforts? This is Chicago. Um, what I would say is certainly um, my health commissioner, uh, Dr. Bashar Shakir, has been quite a champion on this locally and, and even nationally um, he speaks about this issue. But also my mayor, um, Mayor Rahm Emanuel, was an amazing champion on this. Uh, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the health organizations, a pretty broad coalition of health organizations that rallied around this. Um, including representatives from the African American, Latino, and Asian communities. Um, it was a broad coalition approach that got us to where we were last week. And Chris in Minnesota, any particular champions that you had that assisted in your efforts? Yeah, so we, I mean, we had a, a coalition, the Raise It for Health Coalition um, was very diverse, over 30 organizations. Um, we had many physicians. We had um, students. We had youth. We had um, all of our voluntary organizations. Um, so the, it was a very broad tax effort. Um, and I would say that equally on the, the, in the discussions of pursuing additional regulation of e-cigarettes, um, we've got the same statewide coalition, so we're, we're very uh, fortunate to have many strong organizations at the table. Great. So we have time for one last question, and this last question actually has to do with the um, enforcement of some of these particular policies. Uh, Chicago, I know your policy hasn't gone into effect yet, but uh, Scott, perhaps you might be able to talk a little bit about um, how this particular policy is enforced. Sure. We we've already, when it comes to the public use piece of it, we've already were involved in the enforcement of our smoking ban. So the enforcement is is really done the same way. I mean, we we take the complaints, we respond to them, and then uh, go out and do an inspection, just like we would if it was um, uh, smoking. Great. This is Chicago. I would just add to that that one of the hallmarks of a good smoke-free policy is that it will be one that is self-enforcing. That's what makes these policies work so well. And frankly, that's one of the primary arguments for why we should be including e-cigarettes in our smoke-free policies, because it helps eradicate the confusion that then chips away at self-enforcement, which is so important to our smoking bans. I would like to echo that, too, in that 
we, although we do in active enforcement, it is complaint-based. And typically, you know, when we first did the, the smoking ban went into effect, there was hundreds and hundreds, almost a thousand complaints. But today, you know, and, and sort of every year, it's kind of stabilized at around 150 to 200 complaints a year, which is not very many for a county that's almost 2 million people. And I'll just open it up to our uh, presenters. Any last comments that you'd like to make? Thank you for the opportunity. All right. If we didn't get to address your questions uh, during today's webinar, we will be putting together a FAQ document. And to the extent that we are able, we will try to address those uh, questions after the webinar. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Diana. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our webinar. As we mentioned earlier, you will be immediately directed to an evaluation at the conclusion of today's webinar. Please take a few minutes to complete our survey as it provides us with useful information for future projects. ASTHO and NATO would like to thank the CDC Office on Smoking and Health for sponsoring this webinar. And we would also like to thank our speakers, Mark Meany, Chris Bocas, Scott Neal, and Kendall Stagg. A recording of today's webinar will be available on our website within the next few days at the web address shown on your screen. We hope that you will use this webinar as a resource and share the link with others once it is available. If you have any follow-up questions about today's webinar, please contact the team at NACHO and ASTHO respectively. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines. Have a good day.